Episode 59 with Riley DeVoe. Welcome back, everyone. I am your host, Chase Tuning, and this is your weekly source for inspiring content from people who are putting a purpose to their passion and truly living a life ever forward. This is Ever Forward Radio. What is going on, everybody? We're coming to you live from the Hampton Inn, Ohio. I am recording this in my hotel room here at the tail end of my Arnold weekend trip in Columbus, Ohio. Please forgive my voice and the the acoustics, the hotel room. For some reason, they didn't have a podcast-friendly room, and my voice is just shot from being at the expo for the past two days, meeting so many amazing people, hanging out with uh, my good friends over at the Alpha booth, new friends and old, Mr. Nick Bear, Zach Kravitz. Also got to make the rounds and go meet Emily Duncan for the first time in person. It's always fun to meet internet friends in real life. Same thing with Chrissy McCagney over at Donuts and Deadlifts, Matt Vincent over at Hate Brand Goods, Travis S. P. Science again. So to all my friends that I met finally, it was really good to put a, uh, a face to a name and a voice. And to everyone that I met, the Ever Forward Podcast Nation, the the followers, the subscribers, the, uh, the friends, the community here from Ever Forward. It was so great to meet so many of you. We had a great time here at the Arnold, my first time at the convention, and uh, always fun to just let loose for a little bit and just shake off the expo vibes because, man, walking around that place, is, it's a human zoo. It's crazy. It's packed shoulder to shoulder. You're yelling, you're screaming. <laughs> and then uh, Saturday night, everybody kind of just shakes it off. Had some great dinner, shared a few drinks, shared a few dance moves, Well, we'll call them dance moves. I don't really know what I'm doing, but regardless, we had fun. And actually, Riley, Riley DeVoe, today's guest, I met him in person. He came down from Canada, got to shake his hand, put a put a name to a face, like I said, and hang out with him for a little bit. He was, I think, doing some interviews. Great place to connect, great place to network and uh, pick some people's brains. And you all know that I am a, a huge fan, a believer, a, a friend of the Bear Performance Nutrition line, Nick Bear. Uh, got to hang out with him again this weekend. He was over at the Alpha Clothing booth. They are one of the sponsors here on the podcast, on Everford Radio. And BPN actually, by the time this goes live, they should still have some stock. But man, I want to share with you all a limited supply of their pre-workout. They launched a strawberry margarita flavor. And I haven't tried it yet. It's waiting for me back in D.C., but I was talking to Nick about it. And he said it's actually his favorite flavor yet. So I know that guy tries a lot of pre-workout. He tries a lot of different flavors. They do so many different samples. And for him to say it's his favorite, it must be really amazing. So check it out. BPN, Bear Performance Nutrition, new strawberry margarita, limited edition. They only have a few hundred bottles left of this. So hopefully by the time you're listening, they have some in stock still. Go ahead and check it out at either bearperformancenutrition.com, bpnsups.com. And as always, make sure you use code EVERFORD at checkout. That'll save you 10% off of this limited edition pre-workout and any and every future order at Bear Performance Nutrition. All right. So go ahead and enjoy this episode with Mr. Riley DeVoe. Well, um, let me introduce you to the audience, man. You know, Riley DeVoe, welcome to the podcast. Welcome to EVERFORD Radio, my friend. Oh, thank um, you for having me. Thanks for hopping on. Yes. Yeah, so thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm, like I said, I've been a big fan for quite a while. I actually found you through listening to uh, the guys over at Mind Pump. And, uh, oh, nice. I, yeah. And, uh, I, I've been a big fan of the podcast. I've binge watched quite a few, or I guess binge listened to quite a few episodes leading up to this. So I'm, I'm really excited to be on here. Cool, man. Yeah. That's what I love about this world. You know, we find one person through another person through another person. I actually connected with the Mind Pump guys because they were on an episode of one of my other favorite podcasts, Wellness Force Radio. And I was like, man, these guys are wild. They're like so kind of like against the grain in a good way that I, I reached out and I interviewed all three of them late last fall. I don't know if you heard that one, but then they like sent an open invitation basically. Hey, everyone up in San Jose, come on out. So I took them up on it, went out there. They're just as great and cool and 
inviting in person as they are over the phone. So I was like, it wasn't just like a pity invite <laughs> that I took them up on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, actually, right in the now, I'm going through the process of individually interviewing Sal, Adam, and Justin um, and sending out some individual episodes on Everford Radio with them. So stay tuned, man. That's awesome, man. They're, they're uh, like I said, they're, and individually, I think it's a great idea. They're, they're so different which makes their yeah. show together so great, but I mean, it makes them individually like fantastic, especially on separate interviews. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Riley, we were talking earlier and you're, you're calling in from, from Canada. What, uh, what's the world like up there for you today? Well, I uh, actually just got off of a 30 hour drive. Uh, I was up in uh, Fort Myers beach, Florida for, for a week, just taking some time, you know, doing some stuff. And, uh, I, I drove back 30 hours. It was, tw- I guess, I, I guess I should talk in Fahrenheit since you guys don't use Celsius up there, but it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. it was uh, 80 degrees when I left and it's, uh, it's 36 here today. So, I mean, it's a little bit of a culture shock back, but I'm, you know, enjoying being back home and being back in the snow. Oh man. Yeah. Talk about going from one, one extreme to the another. Well, I mean, if you, being Canadian, right? Like you grow up in it and I, I never realized how people didn't didn't live like this and didn't understand it until I, uh, I started becoming friends with people from California and then they get down here and they, they literally have never seen snow and they're acting like it's, uh, like it's like they're on another planet. It's, it's ridiculous. And I'm just like, yo, I don't want to go outside. It's freezing. I've lived my whole life here. Can you, can we please go back? In the house? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, it's a, uh, Toronto's a great place. I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying being back. And like I said, it's, it's nice. Once you're used to it, the snow isn't, isn't too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Just get acclimated. You're good in pretty much any condition. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So Raleigh, your, your main platform, your, your baby, your project is Trinity for change. So if you could introduce, you know, your background and what brought you to, to creating this platform and, and sharing this message and what is Trinity for change all about and you know, what are you all about? Sure, man. So, uh, this is, yeah, this is, this is where I started. So, I mean, I, I could bring it all the way back. I mean, if you want, I can start from, from the real beginning. Like I was, so basically when I was 13, um, my grandmother, who was, who was a big part of raising me, she was like a big part of my life. Um, my, my, my dad worked, he started a company, so he was busy basically all the time. Um, my mom did her own thing. She was, she was home, but I mean, she, she had a couple other kids to raise and we, we grew up with a big family. There was about at one point, like my whole family was living in the house. There was like 15 to 19 of us at any given time. And, uh, wow. yeah, so it got, it got pretty crazy in here and people moved in and out and did their thing. So around 13, my, uh, my grandmother did pass away and she was the, like the matriarch kind of like everybody kind of was under her in the, in the family because on my dad's side, there really isn't anybody like that. I have very small family on that side. So she passed away and that, I guess, I don't know if it was at the time that I was just going through like some sort of puberty or something like that at 13. And, and that's when the, the mental health issue started because obviously, um, mental health doesn't start from a single a single thing. Right. So that wouldn't have caused all the things that happened. But at that time, my depression like blew up. Um, my anxiety went through the roof and I developed OCD. And, um, so for those of you who are aware of the actual types of, um, of mental health issues, I have panic disorder, uh, dyspnea depression, which is like a low grade depression. It's, it's sort of always there, but it comes in and out as I, as I go through life. And then OCD, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's obsessive compulsive disorder. So those things all coupled together made for a really rough, uh, rough go when I was 13. And that culminated in me attempting suicide at about the age of 14. I was just getting in through oh, wow. high school. Yeah. I was just getting in through high school and I just, it wasn't even so much that I was sad or anything like that. It was more that I just didn't want to deal with all this, like the stuff that was going on in my head anymore. I didn't really want to, it was more of a, a culmination of, so my anxiety was shooting through the roof. I was constantly having anxiety attacks where they would basically get at points to the point where I was on the floor in the fetal position, like crying and, and having no control over what was going on. And that's embarrassing, especially for a 14 year old who's in high school and really has no idea how to deal with that. So I would be basically. Yeah, as teen- yeah. as teenagers, we have way, way, other, way more things going on. We have enough going on in our lives to, um, to have to balance, you know, just being a teenager is hard enough, man. But it sounds like it was just, this was compounded so, so much for you. Oh, exactly. And like coming from me, like, these anxiety attacks are coming in. So I'm embarrassed by the fact that I don't want anybody to see me. So I kind of developed kind of a a jerk personality. I was not a nice person in high school and I was mean, like I was, I was genuinely mean. And I obviously like, I came from a background of being a chubby kid and then I lost a lot of weight just through like growing up and all this stuff. And, and, um, so I, I became kind of a bully and I was, I do, I honestly, at this time in my life, I would not like the person I was at 14 at all, but behind the scenes, there was so much building up that, that nobody saw that was causing me to do that. 
that it was just like now looking back at it, it all makes sense. But so at 14, um, I ended up trying to overdose on a bunch of uh, pills. Uh, I, I, I failed. I, I basically vomited immediately and just like panicked and, and, and freaked out in my bathroom was like, what am I doing? Like, how can I fix this? And what, like at that time, and at that time, nobody talked about mental health. Like nobody talked about mental illness at all. No one was really there for me to talk to. Um, I had no outlet. I didn't even have a therapist at this time because nobody really knew I had any issues. It was right after I was diagnosed and the therapist tried to put me on a bunch of medication. And I was, I was very hesitant because I, I held this belief that if I went on medication, I would be labeled as crazy. And I really mm-hmm. didn't want to go through that. I was trying to be normal quote unquote. And obviously I, I have a different outlook on it now, but I mean, at that time I was a kid, I, I had no, no clue what I was doing. So the culmination of me trying to commit suicide. And then I, I became basically obsessed with finding ways to, to not only talk about my problems, but like grow from them and, and, and find a way to, to move forward. So after that, I, uh, I went through a bunch of therapists, a bunch of different things and everybody just keep kept pushing medication, kept pushing medication. And no one really wanted to talk about the bigger issue, which was that in the world, there's no one to talk to. Like, There's no help for people who have mental health issues. And eventually, um, I got onto a couple medications. Uh, I developed a dependency on Ativan, which for those of you who don't know, is a anxiety medication. So I was taking it for, for flying because flying really triggered my anxiety to the point where I couldn't even like get on planes. Like It was bad. I had to be um, not sedated, but I had to be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like almost strapped in, like I couldn't be like allowed to move because I was constrained. Li- constrained. Yeah. Because I would literally have like massive wow. screw, like bad panic attacks. It's, it's, it's better now. I found ways to deal with it, but I mean, it was, it was really, really rough. And, uh, so I developed a dependency on Ativan and I was taking it like every day, all the time. And, uh, I ended up getting off of it. Thank God, because it was starting to become a, an actual problem. And then that around that time I was about 18. So I'd been struggling with this for, for four years, like trying to different medications and different methods and nothing was working at all. And it was around this time that I actually started listening to, um, Joe Rogan's podcast, which was a huge, huge change in my life. As, as weird as that sounds to, well, I mean, we're both in the podcast industry. I mean, you know how much a single episode even can change the way you look at the world, but the way, so I started listening to Joe Rogan. Oh, changing the trajectory. Oh, completely. And I started listening to Joe Rogan. It was right around the time he was getting into like a different style of eating and focusing on nutrition and all these things. So I changed my outlook on nutrition completely. Um, I started eating whole foods. I started eating just better foods, uh, higher fat, a little bit lower carb. You know, I still love food. I, I'm not going to lie. I, I do enjoy the donut every once in a while. I do enjoy ice cream. It's my favorite thing ever. But I found that just doing that small little switch of going from eating all processed crap and not caring to eating more nutrient dense whole foods, I became a different person. My depression came down, my anxiety came down, my OCD, whatever, like that still bothers me, but that has a lot to coupled with my ADHD. Uh, but it, it came down a lot. And I mean, it was very, very massive in finding it. And I was wondering, okay, if this helped me, like what else can help me? So I started getting real addicted into things like, like doing heat therapy and cold therapy and, and, um, even looking into things like shock therapy and just, just things like that, that, that basically, um, wouldn't cause me to go back on clinical drugs, wouldn't cause me to go back to pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. And those things really changed my life. And I was thinking at that time, I was about 19 and I was thinking, what can I do to get this out there? So that's where Trinity actually came from. It started as a public speaking situation where I wanted to just get the information out to people and say, look, there are other ways you can change this. You can treat your mental health. You can do all these things. You can, you can bring yourself out of this problem that you're having mostly naturally. Now I'm not disregarding the need for medication, but I'm saying that there are other ways. There are 100% other ways. I don't know if you're familiar with, um, Dr. Rhonda Patrick. Oh yeah. Found my fitness. Yeah, exactly. So she has a, she released a study on, uh, the effect or she, I don't think she released the study. Sorry. She basically made me aware of a study on heat therapy about using a sauna at 179 degrees Fahrenheit for an extended period. I think it was over 20 minutes and it produced, Oh yeah, it's, it's brutal. But I mean, I do it five times a week now. It produced, uh, effects similar to pharmaceutical drugs in people with a uh, major depressive disorder and lasted up to six weeks after treatment, which is no way mind blowing. It's incredible. So that's what I wanted to do. I was like, I want to do things like this. I want to create something where people can, people can find other ways outside of, outside of uh, pharmaceuticals to treat their mental health issues. And that's where Trinity came from. So I was basically, so basically what Trinity is for those of you, sorry, that was a really long winded intro to what my company is, but <laughs> no worries, man. Um, Trinity is a clothing company because I needed something to sell. 
I needed something that wanted people to get into this community. Originally, like I said, we were going to be a public speaking company, but we moved into clothing because people wanted to represent the brand in a way that was outside of public speaking. And I wanted to take it worldwide. So I wanted it to not just be me going around to places in Ontario and talking to people. I wanted it to be something that anybody could represent. So Trinity, basically, we take 25% of our, to- of our total profit at the end of the year, and we ch- are trying to fund alternative studies for mental health. So this year, I think we're looking into using the University of Toronto or the University of Queens, or these are all Canadian universities, and we're looking into funding some sort of alternative research on mental health. So like something along the lines of maybe that heat shock protein or using fasting to benefit um, your mental health or things that are outside the spectrum of pharmaceutical drugs, because I think that those things are just incredible absolutely incredible at treating mental illness. Riley, I want to go way, way back to kind of that origin for you, man, that at such a young age, I think coming to grasp with anything or just being different from your peers, you know, I can certainly remember, you know, when I was seeing someone in class and they were wearing something different or had a hair, different haircut or, you know, insert anything different here, you're hyper aware of that as a teenager, Going into puberty, I mean, your hormones are just racing like crazy, and we're all trying to climb the social ladder. But man, throwing in all of this this mental illness and diagnosis at such a young age, can you share with us what was it like to just come to terms with that? You know, it sounded like you really kind of just accepted it at a pretty young age, or you know, fairly soon. Was it that easy for you? Was it like, Hey, Riley, this isn't just you acting in a different way or being different from your peers, but there's actually something chemically going on different with you. Um, you know, what what was that, that awareness? Like, what was it like to kind of just accept that there was a reason for it and then living with that reason? So, so it was interesting, um, to say the least. I mean, you're coming in, like you said, you're coming into high school. Uh, you want to be cool. You want to be liked. You want to be the, the top of the food chain because anybody else below you, like as much as people say that high school isn't like a movie, I mean, there are very clear social tiers that you go through and that you see. And for me, it was more, I was ashamed, which sounds weird because I mean, all my life right now is about getting people to talk about their mental health and getting people to, to discuss their illnesses and, and, and move past it. But I wanted to be the quintessential top of the line guy. I wanted to be the, I don't know how to explain it. I wanted to be the the, the head of the food chain. I wanted to be the cool guy in high school and everything about my personality morphed to make me kind of become that person. And I would like to say that I went through high school as a very, very popular person. I had lots of friends. Um, I was very well liked by most people, except the people who I decided I didn't like because those people basically were the, the, they took the brunt of relentless bullying for me. I'm not going to lie. And But going back on that, I mean, behind the scenes, I was dealing with so much of this just compounding issues that that nobody even had any idea about. Nobody in my high school career that knew me or was friends with me in my high school career understood anything about my mental health. They didn't know about it. They didn't know what was happening. Um, They didn't even know when I attempted suicide. No one at high school, at my high school ever was even told about that. People to come up to me now and after they've heard my story and they were like, man, I've knew you for eight years and I had no clue. And it's just, it's incredible because... The fact that I was two different people at that time really, really allowed me to accept it. It was almost like when I got up for school in the morning and I went to high school, I I didn't have a mental illness. I didn't have depression. I didn't have an anxiety because I was playing a role. I wasn't who I actually was. I would go and if I, if I did have some sort of issue, if I did have some sort of like flare up of of anxiety or I had an anxiety attack, I was in the bathroom. I can't tell you how many times I was in the bathroom um, on the floor of a stall, like literally just weeping and holding my own self and like curled up in the corner. And no one ever knew. No one ever had any idea because I was that good at hiding it. And I have apologized to so many people since high school, just because those little things made me so embarrassed, even though nobody saw anything of it. Nobody saw me doing those things. Nobody knew when I was having like a horrible day. I used to just take days off school. If I had a depressive episode, like I would just not go. And, um, all those things were compounding, like I said, and making me into like a terrible person. I was, I was mean. I was, I was ugh, sarcastic. I was just not somebody I would want to hang out with now. And I've apologized to so many people because of those things, because I was like that because I was, like I said, playing two different characters. I was the real Riley who was ugh, ashamed and sad and freaking out all the time and having all these breakdowns and just not knowing what to do and not knowing how to deal with it. And then I was the high school Riley who was making fun of people and being loud and joking and laughing and then who would sneak away to the bathroom and have these breakdowns. And like, I, I don't even know. 
you say I've accepted it at a young age, but I don't think I ever really accepted it until now. I mean, I still thought I was different. I still thought I was weird. And I feel like everybody going through puberty has those issues, but mine and lots of other kids who go through this are at such a different level because not only are you dealing with the normal hormones and all these things, but you're dealing with the fact that there is a chemical imbalance in your brain and you are not acting in a way that normal people act, quote unquote, normal people act. How do you know, or how, how did you know, maybe now having some perspective, how did you know that this wasn't normal? You know, it's again, you know, going back to kind of just the time in your life, you know, being a teenager, what is normal? <laughs> you know, anything Fire. we do is so, you know, it, hormone driven and just, you know, we're acting out. We don't really, you know, we're becoming aware of different things around us and certainly with our bodies. How did you know that this wasn't just feeling different or just, you know, uh, an emotional response? This was you caught in a duality. So I didn't actually, um, I, I didn't know I, I, for quite a while, actually, I thought that it was just like going through puberty. I thought everybody felt like this. I thought it was just kind of the way that it was. And, um, then I got into the actual act of like considering committing suicide. And I realized that obviously that's not normal. I mean, no matter what, that's, that's not something that, and maybe that was just the way that my brain worked. Maybe I was just, uh, I don't know, more, more, um, understanding of it. I don't, I don't know how to really put it, but I was, I knew that that wasn't something that people do. Obviously people don't commit suicide or at least people vastly don't commit suicide in large numbers. You know what I mean? Like it's not something that's, that's quote unquote done all the time. And after that, after getting to that point, when I finally went to the, uh, to the therapist and was like, look, there is something wrong with me because I don't want to be alive anymore. I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to be on this planet anymore. Um, that's when I sort of really realized that I wasn't quote unquote normal, that I had something wrong with me. And then actually getting the, the diagnosis was kind of a relief. I mean, I had no clue really. I didn't know what was wrong with me. And then as soon as they told me, Oh, this is what you have. I was like, okay, well that I can work with. I mean, that, that has definitive or definitive, sorry, that has definitive characteristics that I can look out for and that I can try and treat. And that's obviously where I started to become obsessed with like various ways of treating myself. But when you are told that you have something and you're told that this is like what's going to happen, it's almost like I said, a relief because you start realizing and connecting things that you never really thought were connected to those things as being a part of your mental illness. So like, obviously I would have days of, of depression where it would just seem like I didn't want to get out of bed. I, I physically couldn't get out of bed. My body hurt. Um, I would develop flu like symptoms, which were really brutal. And I thought I just had a weak immune system or I thought like, Oh, teenagers don't want to go to school. Obviously I don't want to get out of bed in the morning, but this was to the point where I wasn't getting out of bed for three or four days or five days or a week. And I would just miss school and not go and like, be like, Oh, well just teenagers take time off school. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm 14. Like none of this really has any issue. Like obviously people do this, but then when you connect it to the fact that you have depression, you realize that, Oh, no, no, no. This is like a flare up. This is like, and this is a really messed up comparison, but you can look at it almost like a herpes flare up, which is how I always looked at it because it made me laugh. Um, <laughs> that's extreme, man. Well, it, it made me laugh. You know what I mean? And if you can't laugh at yourself, you can't like, what are you going to do with your life? So, very true, very true. so I looked at it like that. It's like, Oh, it's a flare up. So you, you can't get out of bed. You can't do that. And then afterwards, obviously looking back at it, like it does make you laugh because you're not in that mind state all the time. But yeah, so I would look at it like that, like, as, oh, I was having a flare up and like, you can't get out of bed. You can't do this. And I mean, those times are really, really, really horrible. But I thought that all teenagers felt like that. I really did. I thought that you just, nobody, oh, I don't want to go to school. I don't want, oh, my body hurts. I thought, honestly, I thought a lot of it was psychosomatic. I thought I was making it up until I actually got the diagnosis. Then I was like, okay, now this makes sense. And, you know, earlier you said that you, once you finally got the awareness around, you know, getting the diagnosis, you, you, you were diagnosed. I have to imagine that for anyone going through any type of mental health disorder or even just, you know, questioning things, um, acting out differently, thinking differently, you know, going through these processes of hiding so much of what you're thinking and doing. And then, of course, you know, feeling shameful for it. The person that you talk to first what is that like? That has to be probably one of the most uncomfortable things and scary things because you're sharing this part of yourself that you hide literally from the entire world. Who was that person for you? And what was it like to, to share this side of you that you had kept hidden and secret for so long? So this is interesting because most people would expect me to say a therapist would be the first person that I talked to. But I talked to uh, my friend, actually. I have a friend, Izzy. She's still my best friend um, to this day. We've been friends for probably nine years now. 
And, uh, I, I told her, I go, look, this is how I'm feeling. And she was actually the one who told me, she goes, you need to go see a therapist. And I told her everything and it's super uncomfortable. You're right. It's, it's not something that you want to say, especially when you've have this, this, this image that you've built out about yourself that like, Oh, this is who I am in public. This is who I, I'm aspiring to be. This is who I walked into high school as, you know what I mean? And I had that mentality of I'm the quote unquote cool kid. And then you actually see it and you're like, Oh, this isn't who I am now opening up all this other stuff that you've had bundled up even from yourself. So the things that you've kept hidden from even yourself that you weren't open about start pouring out because you're just an open book. And finally you have somebody who will accept what you're saying and just listen. And even if they don't accept what you're saying, you within yourself has have made the decision that you're going to tell them. So they basically have to sit there and listen while you spew built up anger and built up depression and rage and all these things that are just inside you that you haven't been able to talk about. And it just comes pouring out. And at the end of the conversation, she just looked me in the eye and said, look, I understand. And she really does. She goes through her own stuff and she's, and I think that's why we're still such good friends. But she looked at me and she said, look, you need to go see a therapist. You need to go talk to somebody. You need to just have this conversation with somebody who can tell you what's wrong. And that led me to my first therapy session. And literally within the first couple sessions, he said, look, this is what you have. We've, we're going to run some, like some, some, uh, psychology tests and do some like forums and stuff. I, I filled out a lot of like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A lot of like, uh, surveys and stuff like that. And did a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. Questionnaires and things like that. But he goes, this is what you have and this is how we're going to treat it. And he immediately started to try and prescribe me pharmaceutical drugs. And at that time I was not, not ready for that. I was like, no, I'm not crazy. Like you can't put me on medication. I had this overwhelming fear that they were going to put me in a, an insane asylum. And like, I don't know why, but it was just like 14 year old me was like, no, 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 no. We're not going to an insane asylum. Like that's not happening. No medication. So I bailed out of there pretty quick and I haven't, I actually never went back to that doctor. I've had, I think five therapists just because people, I don't know. I find that I, I learn as much as I can from one person and then I move on. Does any part of you regret opening up and sharing this? Not maybe specifically with this person, but just with anyone in general, does any part of you wish you, you didn't share this with anyone else other than yourself? Um, that's a hard question because at the time, yes. At the time, I wish that I didn't talk to certain people about it just because not a lot of people, like not everybody was supportive. Every, a lot of people stopped hanging out with me, uh, didn't want to talk to me, thought it was weird. And obviously that happens. But I mean, that all brought me to where I am now. And every friend that I lost because of my mental health issues, and I've gained five friends that I truly believe are wonderful people who like me for me. And like I said, in high school, I wasn't the person that I am now. I was, I was a jerk. And 90% of the friends that I held back then were friends with that version of me. And the fact that I was open with them and this, I was obviously open with them way after I was diagnosed and after therapy, I was probably like 16 by the time I even told any of these people, any of this stuff. And they just looked at me like I was crazy. And it's like, obviously you don't understand, but I'm supposed to be your friend. You should look at me with like a little bit of like, I don't know, just love, like not, I don't want pity. I hate pity first of all, but look at me with, with love and just understand that this is something that I go through. And this is, this is me being open with you as your friend. But then you look at them and all they, all you see from them is like, they look at you like you're weird and you're like, Oh, why am I friends with you again? And like I said, like moving on, it's like those people were great at that time in my life. But now it's like, I'm friends with people who understand this thing and understand that, yeah, I have these things. And sometimes I'm going to be a little strange. And sometimes maybe I won't call you for a month and, and maybe I'll have these issues that I have to deal with on my own before I can even talk to you about them. But these people love me for me. And I think that that's a lot better of a place that I'm in. Uh, yeah. I, I guess that to answer your question, sorry, I keep running off, but to answer your question. Yeah. At the time I definitely felt like I shouldn't have told these people, these things, but now looking back with a little bit of perspective, I understand that it pushed me forward in my growth and, and made me kind of the person that I am today because I dropped that part of my life and, and opened this new one. Crazy. I'm sure for a lot of people, it all comes down to that one word that you don't want to be associated with. You don't want to hear, or you don't even want to think about yourself in that way as, Oh, they're going to think I'm crazy. I'm not crazy. I don't need crazy pills. What is this word? You know, so for someone who has gone through and is still dealing with these clinical disorders, what does that word mean to you? What, what did it mean to you then before you became open about this? And, you know, what does it mean to you now? Yeah, man. Uh, crazy is an interesting thing because 
people have called me it and I've called myself it and I've said that I don't want to be it. And starting off, like I said, I, I had this obsession with not wanting to be crazy. I, I remember sitting in my kitchen with my dad and this was right after I kind of talked to him about everything. It was right after I was diagnosed and we were talking and all this stuff and he's going, you should really consider medication. And God bless my dad. Cause he had no idea about any of the stuff that I was going through, like no clue. And he tried very hard to learn about it, but he was sitting in the kitchen about me. And obviously all the literature says, Oh, medication can help. Medication can do this. Medication can do that. And I remember just weeping at my table, trying to get him to understand and screaming. I'm not not crazy. I'm not crazy because I just wanted him to understand that I'm not different just because I have these disorders. I'm just me with a little bit of perspective. I'm me that understands what's actually going on in my head. And I didn't want to be put on the medication because I did have a negative connotation. I thought, like I said, that I was going to be put in an asylum. I thought that that was what was in front of me. I thought that was where I was going. And I just wanted nothing to do with that. I didn't want to be a part of it. And now looking at the word crazy, I laugh because Honestly, I am crazy. Like I'm crazy in the best way. We all are. Man. We all exactly. are. Exactly. <laughs> there's nobody. There's nobody out there who isn't. And my girlfriend says it all the time. She goes, "You're so weird." And I'm like, "I know," because nobody, <laughs> nobody. Like I just finished a 60 hour fast because I felt like doing it. I I spend at least at least 30 minutes a day, five times a week in a sauna at 179 degrees Fahrenheit, sweating like crazy. I meditate. Like I do all these things that to the outside world, obviously to the world that me and you live in, like these things are pretty normal. I mean, a lot of people we know do them, but Mm -hmm. you look at the outside world and nobody does that. Nobody does that. Nobody, nobody even podcasts. We're in part of a very small niche group that people don't understand. And yeah, I look at myself and I am crazy, but I'm not crazy because I have mental health issues. I'm not crazy because I have depression, OCD, and anxiety. I'm crazy because I'm different, but I'm not different because of those things. I'm different because that's who I am. And I have grown to love that part of me. And maybe those things attributed to this, maybe those things attributed to maybe without those things, I wouldn't be the person that I am today because I wouldn't have uh, strived, striven. I wouldn't have went out on my own and tried to find these different types of things that have changed my life. And I wouldn't have tried to find all these, these alternative treatments that have ended up just being part of my daily routine. But those things have made me who I am. Not those things aren't who I am only, if that makes sense. I'm not only my mental health issues or my clinical diagnosis. I'm me. And that's why I'm crazy. So now I've kind of taken what used to scare the hell out of me and make me terrified that they were going to put me in an asylum because I was quote unquote crazy. And I've made it kind of who I am. And I love myself for that. I really do. Yeah, it, it, that's funny. Um, so many people have the same connotation, you know, at least in my experience, you know, I have been around some people and known some friends who, you know, are on antidepressants, anti-anxiety medication. And, you know, they, they laugh and joke about, you know, my crazy pills or I'm not crazy. I just need this so I can, you know, like you're saying, you know, I need to fly. Um, it, we've kind of created this connotation towards this, this stigma that um, I always am, become hesitant to use because, this day and age, you never know what battle someone is fighting. You never know what medication they're on for whatever reason. You never know what chemical imbalance they may have. And it, the reason why I asked that question about the word crazy is because it's, is that like, is that like the new taboo word that, you know, we're not supposed to say, or, you know, is it that highly offensive to people? Um, you know, but it sounds like, I guess you just have to have a really strong understanding of where you are in your process uh and you have to have some level of acceptance of it because if you're just living in shame and hiding and not embracing who you are and you're accepting that this is who i am yeah that's probably just got to dig at people um so just curious to hear your kind of perspective on that well don't get me wrong if you had called me crazy five years ago i would have been pissed i would have been really mad oh sure sure and i'm sure there's a lot of people who do not share my view i can't speak for everybody who has a mental disorder i can't say that everybody embraces their crazy like I do. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's just a word, right? Like it's just a word. And now obviously in today's society, words mean a lot and people get very, very upset with them. But in my opinion, like if you like a lot of people here, let me, let me put it this way. A lot of people who are in, who have mental health issues, um, they don't like it when you use the word I'm depressed or they don't like it when you say, uh, yes. Oh, yeah. you're, you're acting so bipolar or you're doing all these things. A lot of people don't I'm like so that. anxious. Yeah. yeah exactly. Anxiety. Yeah. Here's the thing. Everybody's anxious. Everybody gets anxious, anxious, being anxious and having anxiety are different things. But why are you getting mad? Because someone who doesn't understand is using a word that you find offensive because you have anxiety. Like, listen to me. I have, so if that sounded weird, listen, I have anxiety. I understand that 
they might not be going through what you're going through. They might not understand what an anxiety attack feels like, because let me tell you something. It is the worst feeling you can ever experience. In my opinion, I, I hate it. It's, it's overwhelming. It's almost to the point where you don't feel human anymore. It's, it's like for me, at least it's curling up on the floor. Like I said, it's blacking out, it's weeping and sobbing and crying and being so much of what you're trying not to be in your everyday life. But the thing is, is first off, the person that's getting angry about somebody who's saying, Oh, I'm so anxious. You don't know. You might not know that person might actually have anxiety. And it's just saying that to describe something else. I can't tell you how many times I've said, Oh, this makes me anxious when it's not giving me an anxiety attack. It just makes me anxious. Like it just makes me uncomfortable. Like I don't feel good being doing this or being here or whatever. Like I say it all the time or even somebody saying I'm depressed. Like people experience depression. If your parent dies or your family member dies or, or anything, even your pet dies, you can experience depression. You can experience a feeling of sadness or emptiness or loss. That doesn't mean you have clinical depression. So getting mad at people for using these words and using these things to describe emotion isn't right in my opinion. I don't think that, that you should be upset about that. I think that this is just part of the human language and the way that people speak. I don't think that you need to get upset about it. I think there's so many other things. Get upset that there's no mental health funding in schools. Get upset that people don't talk about their diseases. Get mm-hmm. upset when people call you call you names that actually mean something. Like, don't get upset when people use something to describe themselves in the way that they're feeling. Because maybe to them, that is depression. Maybe to them, that is uh, uh, the worst sadness they've ever felt. Like, I know that when my grandmother passed away, I experienced depression outside of my actual clinical depression. I was sad all the time. And I don't think that that was part of my clinical depression. I think that that was because I lost my grandmother. I felt a feeling of loss. I felt a feeling of emptiness all the time. And then obviously it came in and kicked into the clinical depression. And that was a different feeling. That was the worst loss I've ever felt in my life. And people can describe it in different ways. And if they don't suffer from anxiety, that might be their most anxious time in their life. And I just think that people get way too quote unquote butthurt over things that don't need to be so upset about like you don't need to spend your day being upset about that celebrate who you are as a person and understand that other people have a different view of the world and try and educate them sure but don't get mad just just try and try and teach them try and if they don't want to listen they don't want to listen then maybe you don't have to associate with those people if that bothers you that much go find a different set of friends but at the end of the day i think we can all coexist just because some words bother you i think that you can really learn to be bigger than that and if you focus so heavy on that all you're going to do is isolate yourself in my opinion again i can't speak for everybody who has a mental health issue but <laughs> i think that it's it's just blown out of proportion at this time like i don't know usually put man yeah it's you know, i'm sure that resonates with a lot of people listening right now whether you know you're the person fighting these chemical imbalances fighting this this mental health issue or you know hopefully some of these words and f- and actions might sound familiar for other people to kind of maybe just take inventory of how you're showing up to people around you, your coworkers, your friends. Um, you know, it, it all comes down to in, in anything we're talking about here on the podcast, fitness, nutrition, mental health. It, it all comes down to just, you know, what awareness do you have about it? You know, are you even aware of what you're doing, what you're thinking, how you're acting, how you're showing up? in your self in your life, but you know, how does that translate into everyone else around you? Um, I think if we all just ask ourselves one simple question in a lot of things we do. And that is, you know, why, why did I say that? Why did I do that? You know, it, it would really help, I think, bring a lot more balance into, into our relationships, into our lives and, you know, probably be less offensive to a lot of people too, at the same time. Oh, 100%. 100%. Riley, what are some, maybe some, some signs, some symptoms, some characteristics and behaviors that someone on the outside can be looking for, you know, maybe in a family member and a friend and a coworker, something that, you know, now that you've kind of, you're, you've been on both sides of the fences, both sides of the fence. Um, you could say, Hey, this is what I was going through. If someone had noticed this, you know, maybe I, I could have gotten help sooner. What are some of these things that we can be on the lookout for to just, you know, be a good friend, be a good, a brother, be a good spouse, be a good anybody and just help someone when they need help. For sure. Um, I think a big thing that you need to look out for is people who go missing. And the way that I say that is like, or the way that I mean that is people who you're friends with, who all of a sudden don't talk to you for a week or don't talk to you for, for three weeks and you tend to write them off. And at least this is my experience. I was tend to be written off by my friends and be like, Oh, he's just busy or he's doing this or he's, he's not responding or they stop inviting me places because I would always say no. But if your friend all of a sudden starts always saying no to going out or always saying no to hanging out or doing anything, 
then all of a sudden you need to look at that as maybe it's something more. And now look, maybe they are just busy. Maybe they are just doing things, but if they're constantly putting off seeing you or putting off going out, or you haven't seen them in a long time, there might be something there. There might be something where they're just locking themselves at home and not wanting to go out because it's too hard. And maybe they don't need to be forced to go out, but maybe they just need you to go talk to them and, and remember and make them know that you still care and not just look at it like, oh, they've disappeared. The biggest thing that I think that they really that you really need to look out for, and this is kind of something that a lot of people have talked to me about and that I've actually experienced myself, is someone who you've known to be depressed or you've known to be constantly down or, or have been going through a rough time and they're, they're not speaking much or they're, they're kind of just like out of it and they're not really paying attention, all of a sudden that person becomes really, really, really happy. That is not a good thing. Tech, people tend to look at that and think, oh, he's getting better. Oh, that's awesome. Like he's getting better. Those are the people you need to watch the most. When you have accepted that you're going to die, when you accept that you're going to commit suicide, your mind state changes tremendously. All of a sudden, you become a different person. You become this upbeat, happy, like outgoing person who just wants to do it all because you've accepted the fact that your life is over. You've accepted the fact after next week or next month or whatever, there's going to be no more pain. You've accepted that you are done. And that changes a person. For me, I was so just out of it the entire month leading up to when I decided I was going to attempt suicide. I was so out of it. I was just done. I was, I was sad. I didn't really talk to anybody. I was very quiet. And then all of a sudden when I made that decision, I was like, all right, nothing can hurt me now. I'm done. I've checked out. Let's enjoy the last week. Whatever. I was a completely different person. I was more of like the person that I am now. Honestly, I was very upbeat. I was trying to be like super happy. And I was, I was walking around with a smile on my face because in my mind I was done. I didn't owe anybody anything anymore. I was literally about to check out of this planet and I didn't care anymore. I was just walking around with a big smile on my face because all these people didn't know that I was done. And it it sounds weird, but it's, I'm not the only person that I've seen this happen to. I've seen many, many, many people who have decided or have attempted suicide and survived say, yeah, for the last month that I decided I was going to, I walked around with the world's biggest smile on my face because I knew I was done. And that's the one thing that I really think you need to look out for. If you have somebody, you know, who is down all the time and upset and sad, or, you know, suffers from depression and all of a sudden they start walking around being captain optimism. You have to look at that person and make sure that person is okay. And really okay. Not just okay on the surface. Okay. Deep down, because otherwise you could very easily lose that person. I I can definitely echo that. That's probably one of the things that I've heard the most was the person that is always down or just, you know, they're like a recluse in their house all the time and never want to do anything. But then all of a sudden they're just a 180 and they're so happy and they're upbeat. And, you know, especially if they start like giving things away or selling a bunch of stuff, that's definitely one of the things that I've heard the most to just be a red flag of, Hey, are you okay? What's going on? You know, wh- why the sudden change? Oh, really quickly. I want to tell you a story. Um, on my probably second year of school. So I moved downtown into the city for school and uh, I lived in like the big city of Toronto, like right near the CN tower. I was like main, main city. So one day I had been, I'd been thrown back and forth and this was my, probably I was about 17. So right before everything kind of came to a culmination of when I was going to start Trinity and everything that was going on. And I had decided that I was going to go for a walk. And this was when my depression was really bad. And my anxiety was really bad. I was actually in the midst of prepping for a bodybuilding show. So everything was kind of culminating on top of the fact that my hormones were screwed up and it was making my depression and anxiety so much worse. And I, t- I went for a walk and I walked up the side of this uh, building. So I walked up to fire escape and up to the top and I was just sitting on the top in uh, Nathan Phillips square for anybody who's around Toronto. Oh wait, is it Nathan Phillips square or is it young and Dundas? I, young and Dundas square. Sorry. So for anybody who's familiar with Toronto, that's where I was sitting up near where the Sharkies is and all that stuff. I was sitting around there and I was looking out over the balcony and it was like probably about 8 PM. And in my mind, all of a sudden, this wasn't a pre-planned thing in my mind, all of a sudden was like, it's probably about 120 foot drop because you jump right now, you're done because you don't have to deal with any of this bullshit anymore. And I was at the point right now where not only was I dealing with my own anxiety and depression, but I was that was compounded with the fact that I was doing a bodybuilding show. I didn't think I looked good. I think I looked horrible. I, I thought I looked horrible. I was like freaking out about that as well. And everything was kind of just pounding in on me. I felt super alone because I was in a big city. I was living with a couple friends that honestly we were drifting apart and it was making everything really, really awkward. Everything was just kind of compounding on one thing. And I was sitting up there and I can say this because he's never going to listen to the podcast. Um, he, we're not friends anymore, but this roommate that I had texted me and he just said, and I, I'm telling you, man, I was 
probably about 30 seconds away from, from, from jumping. I was, I was that far gone Damn. and he shot me a text and just said, Hey man, like, when are you coming home? Uh, I noticed you've been like kind of distant lately. I just want you to know that I love you. And I looked at that text message and I looked at the ground and I sat there for probably another hour crying, just realizing oh what I was about to do. And that one text message saved my life. I, I got down off the building. I walked home and I, that was the last time since then that I've ever even considered suicide because Damn. someone on this earth took the time out, took the five minutes out to tell me that he loved me. And that's all I needed. That's all I needed to bring me back from the edge. Yeah. Damn, Riley. Thanks for sharing that, man. That's, that's an incredible story. I just think that that speaks so much to what you said about, is there anything you can do to be a better friend, be a better brother, be a better person to the people that you love. And honestly, just take the time out. If you really love somebody and you really care about them, tell them, don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till the next week. Just, just tell the people that you love, that you love them as much as you can, because you never know when that could make a difference in somebody's life or when it could be the last time you really don't. Yeah. And it doesn't even really take, you know, the question I asked, you know, what is it, what does it take for us to be, to be a better friend, be a better, whatever. Sometimes you don't need to be a better anything. You just need to be that thing. You need to be a friend, be a brother, be a sibling, be a spouse, be a significant other. You know, they're not to like throw in societal norms and what roles are supposed to be. But you know, if you call yourself a friend to someone, being a friend is being a friend is being a friend. If you're someone's sibling, if you're someone's daughter, if you're someone's significant other, I mean, that has, those come with innate characteristics of what that role looks like. And a lot of times, you know, life gets in the way, society gets in the way, our own personal endeavors get in the way, but that doesn't mean that those people, those relationships in our lives should take the back burner. You know, sometimes it's going to happen, but you know, just again, going back to the awareness of just checking in, okay, when's the last per time I contacted this person? You know, when's the last time I saw them? You know, when's the last time we just did something, the two of us or, um, insert any example of just what being a blank <laughs> looks like. You know, I think a lot of times we just, we get too distant from these roles that we fill in our lives and it can mean a lot more than we ever realize. Well, we take it for granted, man. We take all the situations so of people being around and like, you think like, oh, like you're just a brother, you're just a spouse. Or it's like, oh, well, those people have always been there and they, they yeah, have will always be there. there. Yeah, exactly. And that's so not true. I mean, like you need to take that time out. And like you said, be aware of when was the last time we just talked or when was the last time I reached out or when was the last time we did something just us. And I think that's a huge, huge part of even just not even like mental health and not even just, that's just being a good person and being a good X, Y, Z, being a good spouse, brother, mm -hmm. sister, whatever. Yeah. And yeah, people take it for granted. And I think that if my story proves anything, I mean, take the time out and just, just try, just try and reach out to somebody, mm -hmm. just try and be that person for somebody because it really can make a difference. And at the end of the day, yeah. it's a little selfish. It makes you feel better too. It makes you feel like a good person. And if that's what you need to get to do that and go for it. Yeah, seriously. And my favorite excuse in all this is people always say, I'm, I'm so busy. Work's been crazy. Oh, I've been traveling a lot. Well, you know what? It, this is just a great example. I, I'm, I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm talking with a guy up in Canada and, you know, we are so far, the distance is so much between us right now, but we're having this incredible conversation. There's, an, I find very little belief that there are any, there's any excuse this day and age of why you can't just like shoot an email, send a text, uh, tag someone in a photo, like something, just these minuscule ways that can seem so trivial on the surface, but again, just the society we live in, these things mean something, you know, liking someone's picture, shooting them a text message, following up after an event. I mean, it's small little things that you can do while you're like walking in between the terminal or going to the bathroom. Cause we all know everyone brings their phone into the bathroom. Okay. You're not, you're not <laughs> fooling anybody. Here. So it's just, you know, taking the time out of just of your busy day, because we're all busy. We all have lives. We all have jobs. We all have things we have to do. Um, but just recognize the people in your life that maybe you're not serving the way that you wish someone served you. And, uh, it'll go a long way, man. Well, even looking back, like, I mean, I, I took, I recently took, um, a weekend off my phone. So I turned my phone completely off. I was off social media. I was off everything. Um, I went ghost for like, I don't know, 48 hours or something like that. And, um, I was finding, I had to find things to do to fill time. Like I had to, <laughs> like literally I was like, Oh, I have like hours right now where compounded throughout the day, I would have just spent scrolling through Instagram or doing all these things. So it's like people who say they don't have time, 
it takes 15 seconds to send a, Hey, what are you doing? How are you? This is what I'm doing. Text message. Like you have time. <laughs> you, you do. You just, you, yeah. you fill it with, yeah, scrolling through Instagram or, or checking you Facebook. Fill it with or, yeah. You fill it with yourself. You become self-involved and believe me, I love social media for what it does. I think that it does an incredible job of connecting people. Like, like you said, we never would be having this conversation if it wasn't for social media. Like this is an incredible thing that it's brought to us, but you do waste a lot of time on social media. Like even me where Instagram is, and Facebook especially is like a big part of Trinity and I have to run those things, but taking it away. I mean, I have way more free time in the day. Like even taking away the part of where I'm just scrolling and doing nothing, like take out the time where I'm not creating and I'm only consuming. And I probably add an extra four hours to my day. Like it's ridiculous. I believe it. I believe it, man. Yeah. Well, Riley, for, for everyone listening right now, everything you've heard about the mental health, you know, first of all, if you're ever questioning your own existence, your own life, um, hiding away, feeling shameful, putting yourself in danger. Um, these are all signs and symptoms and characteristics and behaviors that I hope you recognize in yourself. And I, I, I hope that you will seek out the help you need and, and help doesn't mean you have to go check yourself in to an asylum. Like Riley thought, you know, this can be just opening up to a close friend, a, a spouse, a family member, anyone that you trust and feel safe with that is step number one, because hopefully they will help you find the courage or just have the extra courage to take you to, to help you get the professional help that you need. Um, and help comes in a lot of different ways. It can be talking to someone. It can be shutting yourself up in a 170 degree box in the sauna multiple times a week. There's so many ways this day and age that it is acceptable that we're seeing results where the science is there. The, uh, the studies are there, the, the actual people and their real life results are there. So I think we're living in a great day and age where it's not just, we're going to lock you up. We're going to put you in a straight jacket. We're going to shove all these pills down your throat. We're going to make you go comatose, but there are so many ways to treat so many different things these days that don't provide all these detrimental side effects. But the first step is you have to take action and you have to just recognize in yourself that this is not who I want to be. This may, this may be who I am right now, but it doesn't mean I have to stay this way. I don't have to be this person, you know, accept of what's going on in your life, seek the help that you need. And, uh, you know, Raleigh's a great example of being able to just come out on the other side, openly talk about it, share it with people and be, be a champion for it. You know, be the person that other people need in your society, in your job, in your family, because you never know what battle someone else is walking around with. Um, Riley, in, in all of this, you know, again, thank you so much for sharing your experience. I, I can't imagine talking about some of these things or everything is is comes easy. Maybe now it's getting easier because you do it so often. But, you know, how does how does this mental health discussion, how does going through what you did and you know, being the example that you are now, how does this help others live a life ever forward? Well, first of all, I want to say that you mentioned uh, locking myself into a, a super hot box. We need to um, we need to do this podcast again for sure because uh, we didn't even get into the alternate uh, yeah, the yeah, alternate yeah, treatments. Yeah, that's and I know, a whole episode, I bet. I know you're kind of into the alter, like into the stuff like that as well. You're into the uh, the the um, what's the word alternative medicine? Yeah, alternative, alternative medicine medicine. type of thing. So we'll have to get into that. But as for uh, as for the ever forward, as for helping people live a life ever forward, um, our big thing at Trinity is you are not your mental illness you are so much more. So if you look at me, I have dysthymia depression, I have OCD, I have panic disorder, but I'm not those things. I don't define myself with those characteristics. I am not Riley DeVoe, the depressive, anxious, obsessive, compulsive human being. I'm Riley DeVoe. I do all of these different things. I podcast. I'm on YouTube. I run an Instagram page. Um, I love jujitsu. I work out. I eat this way, this way, and this way. These are who I am. I am a complete human being. I am not just my mental health I am not just my, sorry, I'm not just my mental illness. I am much more than that. And I think that when people look at themselves and they see a depressive human being, or they, they, they think that they are bipolar, or they think that they, they are crazy. If we want to bring it back to that word, I think that it can, it can keyhole you into such a small little box of this is what I am and moving outside of that box and realizing, no, I deal with this stuff every single day, but that makes me a superhero. That means that I have to do this plus everything else, everybody else in the world has to deal with. I have to take all of these things and move on and move forward and move past it. And yeah, I'm not saying that you have to pretend that they don't exist. Acknowledge that you have these diseases and that's what they are. They're diseases. They exist within you and you will never cure them. 
but you don't have to let them control you. You can be so much more. You can be the person that you've always wanted to be just because you can look at yourself as, like I said, much more than these things. And I think that understanding that you are more than these diseases is really how you move forward in life. It's really how you continue to grow and you focus on becoming a better all around person and not just becoming a better all around quote unquote depressive quote unquote anxiety ridden quote unquote obsessive compulsive disorder having human being. These are things that you have. They are not at all what define you. Very well said, my man. Thank you so much again for, for sharing your story and sharing your truth here. Um, Riley, where can my audience connect with you? Uh, where can we find Trinity for change? So for sure, um, you can find me on Instagram at Riley DeVoe, R-I-L-E-Y-D-E-V-E-A-U-U. -E uh, my cousin, who has the same name as me, stole the uh, one with the one U and refuses to give uh. it back to me. <laughs> yeah, he refuses to give it back to me. But anyway, so uh, you can find Trinity at trinityforchange.com. Uh, you can find it on Facebook at facebook.com slash Trinity for change, same on, on Instagram. And you can find the podcast, my podcast at Trinity mindset podcast on iTunes. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much everywhere you can find me. Awesome. Riley, thank you so much again. And I hope you all can check out his content, check out Trinity for change, doing some amazing things up North. And that's going to be a wrap for today's episode. Riley, thanks again. No, thank you so much, man. Seriously. It meant a lot to me. Thank you all so much for joining me again this week. I truly hope that you have enjoyed this episode and its message. If you have found value in Everforward Radio, I would greatly appreciate you subscribing to the podcast, as well as taking just a few seconds and leaving it a five-star rating and review on iTunes. This is the best way to make sure our message continues to reach others. Thanks again, and I hope that this content helps you live a life Everforward.